So this past Tuesday, late afternoon, um, I had traveled down to Walnut Grove. I had a meeting, a board meeting of our Kairos mission ministry team down there. And then I spent Tuesday evening, the early part of Tuesday evening, once again in the Walnut Grove uh, Correctional Facility, a maximum security prison here in Mississippi. If you're in this church or you've been visiting the church, you know uh, I'm down to Walnut Grove quite a bit as part of our mission outreach and a particular kind of mission partnership. But looking ahead at this passage at which we were going to arrive today, I, I had a particular reflection. I was down there in, in, the, in, in that maximum security prison uh, meeting with the Kairos group. Now, the folks that I met with on Tuesday night are the inner core of Kairos trained and committed uh, prisoners in Walnut Grove. It's a smaller group of about 15, 16 of them that typically meet with us. And these are like the core all-in Christians, so to speak, in, in, in Walnut Grove. Now, Walnut Grove can sometimes have up to 600 prisoners. Right now it has, I think, in the range of about 460, 470. But let me just be honest with you. I know some of you may have um, naive ideas about how great it would be to be in a maximum security prison. Um, if, if you want to find out more about that, I can talk with you afterwards. Teenagers, do not set your path to go to Walnut Grove. You don't want to be there. Okay. But um, there are wolves in prison. I know I'm shocking some of you, but there are wolves in prison. There are gangs. There are contraband. There's, there's all kinds of undercover kind of stuff going on. There's violence. There's physical, sexual, mental assaults. And sometimes I'm talking about the guards, to be honest with you. Even before we get to those guys who are in there for those heavy sentences under felonies at that maximum security prison. There's all kinds of corruption, all kinds of bad stuff, all kinds of men asserting themselves against other men. It's, it's, it's a wolf-eat-wolf -wolf kind of environment there in the prison. But Jesus is transformed witnesses. These gentlemen I meet with are not perfect. I will be the first to say they're not perfect. Some of them are in prison for a long time for things like murder, okay? But they are now committed Christians. And some of them are chaplains and worship leaders in the prison. They are transformed witnesses. In other words, they're true Christians. And as true Christians, they stand out and they stand up. They publicly stand up as what? The biggest bad as wolves in the prison? Is that what you're going to fill in the blank with? As slightly nicer wolves, is that, the, is that what we need to say? Well, as Christians, we're still wolves, but we're just kind of like we wear nicer clothes or something like that. We smile a little bit more. No. Amid the wolves, they stand out as lambs. Again, let me explain to you. These guys are not wimps. I mean, <laughs> they are not wimps. They are all felons who have been converted to Christ. But they stand out, and they stand up as lambs. Lambs among wolves. In Paul's letter to the church at Rome, in chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And, and what do we get out of this? Well, Christians are decisively and actively what? How would you fill in that blank in the sermon notes if you're tracking along? Decisively and actively different. God's word says don't be conformed to the world. Don't be molded into what the world says you're supposed to be. But be transformed from the inside out by the Holy Spirit coming to a new understanding. So, in other words, Christians are decisively and actively different. And let me go ahead and say it unworldly. Christians are like, it's like they're from out of this world because they are, right? They've been born anew in the heavenly Holy Spirit. They're not going to act like everybody else. So Jesus says, at this juncture we've come to, go. You notice this is a very blunt command. He is commanding uh, these folks to go. And then he says, behold, and when Jesus uses that term, that means pay attention, I am showing you a miracle. 
Okay, or I'm showing you something you really need to get. Whenever you see that ide there, that behold, um, and that's why I like to translate as behold. Sometimes it's just see, or sometimes it gets glossed over by the translation, but I, I really want you to catch that. Jesus says, this is a big deal. Go, behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. So here's the reality, connecting with Romans 12 and connecting with what we're reading here. Because our Lord, the King, is, now this is shocking, the Lamb. Christians are decisively and actively what? Let's fill it in again. Lambs. Now, he's the Lamb. If we're following him, we are also lambs. And we are self-sacrificial. We're willing to give ourselves away in the power of God's love. So back to Romans 12, the larger verses 1 and 2. Therefore, and the therefore is therefore because Paul is referring back to everything he's developed as far as Christ becoming our righteousness, dying for our sin, uh, this self-sacrificial love of Christ, moving all the way through the new life in the Holy Spirit, and the fact that nothing can separate us from God's love in Jesus Christ, and then moving through the covenant affirmation that no God is not reneging on his covenant with the true Israel. Romans chapter 9 through 11, he is gracious under the covenant. He will fulfill his covenant. Therefore, in light of all that, in light of God's mercies, Paul says, I urge you brothers, in other words, brothers and sisters, to catch this, offer, that's sacrificial language, okay, to offer your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, which is your spiritual worship. Wait a minute, I thought my worship was just like coming to church occasionally and singing a couple songs. No, God's word says your larger worship is to offer sacrificially your whole self, your whole life, and what you do with your body to the Lord. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that by testing you may discern what God's will is. I want to know what God's will is, okay? Offer your body as a living sacrifice. Trust in Jesus and give yourself totally so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That's Romans 12. So here's the reality. I, I want us all to get this. Teenagers, you get this too now. God's gospel upends, turns on its head the world's ways and the world's wisdom. I mean, just let's think through this. Shepherd, Jesus is the shepherd, but he's a lamb. Does that make sense to my fleshly brain? No. Do you see what I'm saying? This is it's all going to be, Jesus turns everything on his head, right? The gospel. The shepherd is a self-sacrificial lamb. The gospel mission, here's the key to the gospel mission. God sends his son, who is the heavenly king, to serve and die for basically trash here on earth, a bunch of sinners. Does that make sense by worldly standards? No. Is that good? Oh yeah, you better believe it's good. It's our salvation, and it's the way the kingdom works, but it's not the way the world works. And that brings us to the really hard to receive core, but rede redeeming truth at the core of the gospel. I know most popular preachers don't talk about this. Most people who supposedly preach the gospel don't talk about this, much less like liberal churches that are dying also don't talk about this. Jesus' life, his mission, his kingdom, are not just a once upon a time fairy tale that we kind of believe in that happened 2,000 years ago and have nothing to do with us now because we can eat popcorn and watch Netflix or go to all the ball games we want to go to. No, no, no. Jesus' life, mission, and kingdom direct, direct our life and our mission and our, our kingdom if we are in Christ. The good shepherd, catch this, it's in our scripture for today, doesn't keep his sheep in a nice, quiet little pasture their whole life. 
well, let's just huddle around with some other sheep that I'm comfortable with. No, that's not what he does. He sends out his sheep as lambs among wolves. And you have to ask and answer the question, is that good? According to the Bible, that's really good. According to my comfort level, that might not be good. It might challenge me. I might actually have to become a new type of person. Exactly, there's the gospel. So let's step back again, and let me just give you this historical perspective. Um, and as I head into this, let's just let me tell you, I've read nobody else that talks about this with respect to this particular passage, or really some other passages too, but to me it's kind of obvious, and I have a high view of Jesus' understanding of the larger world. So to me, it makes total sense that Jesus, who can speak multivalently, is dealing with local things, but also international things at the same time. So let me take you back to Rome. Rome equals wolves. And I believe Jesus is speaking to that at one level, at a larger level, and looking ahead to the ministry that his first and second generation Christians are going to have to carry out to. They're going to be going out, not just in Israel, but out into the Roman Empire among wolves. Okay, and let me explain this. Rome equals wolves. Mars, lead dog god of the Romans, their true heart god, right? Who is Mars? He's the god of what? War. And what does Mars have? What are Mars' pets? He has a pack of wolves. Who are the god slash human, you know, part god, part human, uh, sons of Mars? in Roman heritage. Romulus and Remus. And they are raised by the she-wolf. Do you see that? There's the she-wolf. There's Romulus and Remus. Rome, in case you haven't figured this out yet, is gonna be named after Romulus. And when they grow up, they decide to establish a great city. But you know where brothers are, they fight over it, and Romulus, the true son of the wolf, the true wolf king, comes up with the greatest idea ever. He murders his own brother, Remus. So he alone establishes Rome. Awesome, the Romans say. That's a man who knows how to take over. We need another leader like that, a guy who can really take over and make everything great. So Romulus kills Remus, and that is the heritage, that is the intellectual landscape of the Romans as they take over the world. They are the wolves. They are the people of Mars. They are the people of Romulus. Totally separately, just remember this, in Genesis chapter 4, when Cain kills his brother Abel, that is not celebrated as a great thing in the Bible, is it? That's a very bad thing, the first fratricide, the first murder in the Bible. And Abel's blood cries out to God. It's almost prophetic of how ultimately uh, the good son is going to die for the sake of the larger community and world. That's Jesus, right? So under the way the Bible and God think, it's bad for Cain to kill Abel. With the Romans, hey, you got to do what you got to do to win the war, right? It's good that Romulus killed Remus. So you understand we're talking about radically different worldviews here. So... Rome is into, here are their values, military conquest and power. They're really into their military heroes. They build shrines to their military heroes, and later as they become an empire to their emperors as like little shrines. You know, kind of, if you can imagine like a capital city with a bunch of these shrines with like statues of the demigods sitting on thrones and looking over little ponds and stuff. No, I'm not talking about Washington, D.C., although I guess I could. I'm talking about Rome. They're into patriotism, success, and wealth, money. Ever know anybody into that kind of stuff? Yeah, it's the way of the world. It infects everywhere we live, okay? Now, let's move from Rome to in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And in the New Testament, Jesus and his, his apostles make this very clear. They're not just wolves over there in Rome or running the Roman army or the Roman economy. There are wolves outside and inside Judaism. And 
You get into the New Testament, this is a big theme. There are and there will be wolves not only outside the church, threatening the church, but even maybe more threatening inside the church. And sometimes those wolves are described as wolves in sheep's clothing. We think they're nice. We think they're one of us. But they're actually in it for wealth, power, all that kind of stuff. So let's understanding those levels of what Jesus is talking about. Go back to our key passage. Now, after these things, metadatalta, you're supposed to ask, well, after what things? Okay, quickly. Just remember, go back to the last month and a half of sermons to get more on this, but just remember, Jesus has told his disciples, it is necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things, his first major full prediction of his passion, okay, to suffer many things and to be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, the leading groups of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, and to be killed, and on the third day be raised. That connects with Isaiah 53, verse 7. Like a lamb, did you catch that? Like a lamb led to slaughter. But then also the resurrection prophecy from Jesus connects to verse 11. We've already read it. He shall see light. The one who died, how's he going to see light? He shall see. He shall see light and be satisfied. Okay, now after these things, Jesus also says, If anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Wait a minute, I thought the cross was just your thing, Jesus. No. I'm atoning for your sin. I'm the big cross, but you also are to take a cross and walk around as a publicly condemned criminal, like different from the rest of the world. It needs to be very obvious that you're with me, Jesus is saying. Shocking. Um, he also, at the transfiguration, spoke of his exodus. Remember in the Greek, that's the term that's used. He spoke of his exodus with Moses and Elijah. And remember what happens in the exodus, obviously deliverance and such, but, um, which is key. But also what happens, does anybody or anything get killed as a key to the Exodus deliverance? Yeah, what? Lambs, right? The blood of the lamb. So Jesus is talking about his Exodus, which he is, now catch this, about to accomplish. In other words, it's imminent. We are in urgency time at this point. He's about to accomplish at Jerusalem. That's Luke 9, 31. And then Luke 9, 51, the days were being fulfilled for his ascension, so looking through his cross and his resurrection, now to his ascension, his triumph, right? He set his face to go to Jerusalem. His face is on Jerusalem. Remember, Isaiah 50, verse 7 prophesies this, because the Lord helps me, therefore I have set my face like flint. And remember also the transition into Jesus' is coming to Jerusalem and this need for evangelist, right? Out into the mountains and the fields, right? How beautiful on the mountains. Isaiah 52, now catch this. This is moving from he set his face toward Jerusalem to the lamb who is slain for us in the suffering servant song. Right here in the middle, catch this. As you head into that suffering servant song, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. And bring the good news your God reigns. In other words, the kingdom of God is near. Okay? Your God reigns. The kingdom of God is near. And Jesus says, now y'all go out and tell them, the kingdom of God is near. Uh, finally, at the end of Luke chapter 9, Dean preached on this last week, the three would-be disciples who have all these excuses about why they can't jump in right now. They need more money. They need more time. They need to, like, fix some relationships. Okay? And Jesus has his face set towards Jerusalem, and it is now or never. You're either going to be in with Jesus, or you're going to delay. And if you delay, according to this, you missed it. Every Christian's response to the mission of witnessing for Christ and his kingdom needs to, again, be all in, not partially in, all in urgency, understanding that time is short. And let's unpack this a little bit. Now, after these things, I've told you what these things are. Jesus is gearing up. He's, he's got his face set towards Jerusalem. This is the final tour, right? There's an all-in urgency because the time is short. 
the Lord also appointed 72 others and sent them two by two. A little bit unpacking on this. I won't go into this too deeply. Join me for Sunday school if you want something like this. But uh, some manuscripts say 70. Some add the duo, which add in the Greek to 72, okay? And uh, most people go with the translation of the 72. What's, what's going on with the 72 thing? Well, there's at least two Old Testament points of reference, which I don't want you to get too distracted by, but I will give them to you. Number one, in the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10, in the Hebrew manuscripts, the number of nations is 70, okay? In the Greek Septuagint, the translation of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures over into Greek, the number is 72, which is maybe why the scribes kind of go back and forth on the 70, 72. The point there will be this presages the Great Commission to all the nations. In other words, the nations are gonna be restored and this mission is supposed to have us looking ahead to that. Okay, that's number one. Number two, in Numbers, in the book of Numbers, Moses appoints 70 elders to minister as his delegates. And then he adds two more, Medad and Eldad. So in other words, 70 plus two, do you catch that? 72 elders in Numbers as, and Jesus is the greater Moses, okay? So all that's kind of background. More importantly on the numbers, though, I want you to catch this. He sends them two by two. In the Old Testament, under the law, you need two witnesses for major affirmation and also for judgment against someone, particularly for capital offenses. So Jesus sends these guys out, not only because, yes, Ecclesiastes says two are better than one, you know, they can support each other. There's that aspect, the practical aspect, but they're also being sent as witnesses of the kingdom and either for or against the people they're going to. That's the two by two thing. To every town and place where he himself was about to go. This is the final tour. This is time is getting short here. And he said to them, the harvest is is plentiful, but the workers are few. Now, stop a moment. Some of you all I know have farm backgrounds, right? Or you've been around farms. After all, we're in the South, okay? With a harvest, when the grain is ripe, when the fruit is ripe, when the crops are ripe, do you get to sit around and say, you know what, I'm really busy this year, but in 10 years, I'm gonna to get to that harvest. What happens to the harvest? It's ruined. So one reason Jesus is using the metaphor or the harvest is, man, it is time. And if we waste a month, we're gonna lose everything. If you waste years, you're gonna to totally lose everything. The harvest, Jesus says, total urgency. And by the way, it's a bigger harvest than we thought, so we need even more workers than we have ready to go. Um, and Jesus also tells them in verse 9, he says, Heal the sick in the towns you go to and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. In other words, it's urgent. You better make a decision on the kingdom. So every Christian's response to the mission of witnessing for Christ and his kingdom is about all-in urgency. Time is short. And then it's prayer-based. How's your prayer life? Are you urgent and passionate in your prayers? I, I don't know how many more days I have or you have or how many more years. And also, I don't know what the appointed time is for someone to salvation. But man, you better be praying for them. And you better pray for the workers to go. And if you're going to pray for the workers to go, guess who needs to be willing to go too? Right? Right? That's what's going on here, prayer-based. And notice my little subscript here, believing and praying to Christ as the Lord of the harvest who sends us. I'll come back to that, but first pray. Go back to the sermon that I preached on New Year's Eve, right? December 31, 2023. Remember, we focused on all through Luke. We're being told over and over again, the first thing Jesus does is pray. And the first thing he calls us to do is pray. We are being invited to live a life with God in prayer. And I want to invite you to that. I'm not trying to give you a guilt trip, but just, I mean, honestly, assess what your prayer life is like right now. Are you in passionate prayer? Are you crying over people who do not know the Lord? Are you on fire for the gospel? If not, pray that the Lord would engender that in your heart for a new season of real prayer. 
not just kind of a rote ritual thing you go through. Okay, and notice what the prayer is. If you tell me I don't know what to pray, I'm giving you a prayer today. It's literally from the words of Jesus. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And let me just tell you this, with the Greek here, it's pretty emphatic. This is not the apostolo verb base that you're using in these other sins. This is ekbalo, which means to throw out. In other words, you're asking the Lord of the harvest to get forceful with people. Well, I know he doesn't want to go. Yeah, you need to shake him up, Lord. Please shake him up. Shake him up and cast him out into the harvest. Okay? This is not just kind of send them out in the harvest. This is ekbalo. Throw out. Throw them out. Change their routine. Please, Lord, change their routine so they will go. So there's a specific prayer for you. Pray that one with real heart and real spirit every day about the harvest and the mission of Christ. And let me just tell you this. In the Bible, harvest means combo, judgment and salvation. And it's kind of an either or when the rubber hits the road. Harvest, God gathers his own in the harvest and he cast out and burns those who are not part of the harvest. It's not Martin talking, I'm telling you, that's running all through the Bible. Now then notice this, catch this, believing in and praying to Christ as the Lord of the harvest who sends us. You could miss this, so I want you to catch this. Jesus once again is making clear he is divine. Because look at this. Who, the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the Lord of the harvest is God, right? Who's the Lord of the harvest here? Jesus. Let me show you. The Lord appointed 72, and the Lord, Jesus, sends them. He doesn't say, Father, please send. He himself directly sends. Jesus says, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest, and guess who's already sent out, and guess who in turn sends them out immediately in response to this? Jesus himself. Okay? He, he's making very clear, I'm the Lord of the harvest, and it's my harvest. Go, behold, I am sending you. You just prayed for the Lord of the harvest to send, and Jesus says, yeah, I'm sending you. As lambs in the midst of wolves. So believe in Jesus. He's the Lord. And he's in charge of the harvest. You work for him. You can trust in him, even in the face of opposition. Which brings us to um, three. Go as lambs. What? Yep, go as lambs. Dependent, humble, and prophetic ambassadors of peace. Jesus says, I'm sending you as lambs in the midst of wolves. In the following verses. Notice this. Lamb-like. How many Christians who are really out, out, out front in their witness are lamb-like do you know? This, this would actually take a movement of the Holy Spirit to get somebody who likes talking to other people about the faith but is lamb-like as opposed to aggressive, right? But that's what he's asking for. Lamb-like, dependent, humble, and prophetic ambassadors of peace. Now, it's clear Jesus has no illusions about the world's basic hostility to God, to God's kingdom, to Jesus, and to people Jesus sends as his witnesses. As the African... An African American theologian, Tabiti Anyawibi, says, Wolves snarl, bear their fangs, circle around, ready to tear into defenseless lambs. Everything that is a predator is stronger than the lamb. And Jesus is saying, Exactly. And we're saying, So, so why, why do you have this strategy, Jesus? Why are you sending us like this? So here's the insight to Jesus' prophetic kingdom strategy. David Gooding, in his commentary on Luke, says, Christ's tactics were to send his disciples utterly defenseless and dependent on the townspeople's mercy. Jesus' disciples were to carry no cash, no spare clothes, no provisions. The effect would be to force the townspeople to a decision as to what they should do with these guys with nothing on them coming into town who are saying, we represent the Messiah of God. If the missionaries had enough money to support themselves, 
then letting them hire a room in a hotel would be a simple commercial transaction with no spiritual implication. But if these people in the towns are faced with destitute missionaries, they have to decide, am I going to take them in or reject them? Am I going to actually believe the message of the kingdom or reject it? It's a brilliant strategy by Jesus. See, Jesus is actually a lot smarter than the world. So Jesus says, go, behold, I am sending you as lambs in the midst of wolves. And as he sends us, to close here, let me encourage you to trust in his strategy. I know we want to tend towards the, like, maybe kind of nice version of the wolf strategy. No, no, no. Trust in Jesus' strategy. And know that his, remember how I said they go before his face? That's literally the Greek there, and it picks up on the theme running through Luke 9. Understand this. When his face is on you, you are under his blessing. Even if you are martyred, you're with him forever, and his blessing is on you. In the Bible, when the Lord's face is on you, and when you go before his face, you're under his total, powerful blessing. So he sends these folks out as lambs, two by two, before his face. The lamb is the shepherd who is the king, eternal. And he will have you in his eternal communion. Believe it. Trust in that. That's bigger than anything else from day to day. And as Jesus says to his disciples, as Jesus himself prepares to go to um, Gethsemane and then the cross, John chapter 16, verse 33, I have said these things to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. You won't have peace in the world. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Believe Jesus and go with him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.